So welcome to what I think is going to be a really mind-expanding session and encourage all of us to think a bit more outside the box. Um, I'm going kind to of very briefly sort of introduce myself because I'm not really a kind of chair panel type of person so I was <laughs> surprised to be asked to do this but um, I guess it's because although I'm primarily a filmmaker I have explored the world outside of television and many years ago I made a film for Jan called The Death of Klinghoff, an opera film which has led to directing an opera at the Met later this year. Um, doing a film about gangs had led to a big installation that I'm doing at the Roundhouse. And in the autumn, um, a piece, a film piece, but it's going to be projected on a building um, rather than, again, within the confines of television. So there is a world outside of television, and it's a very exciting and interesting world to explore. And we have a wonderful panel here who are going to encourage us further. So... Um, Jan Younghusband, who is the commissioning editor of BBC Music and Events, and through her work she's won Oscars and BAFTAs and Pre Italia. And I guess that is, I, she'll be talking about having, still having some interesting space to do authored work uh, within the television. Um, David Metcalf, who's the founder and artistic director of Former, and they present cross cultural productions in major venues and festivals uh, across the world. And we're uh, really, really interested to hear the kinds of work that you commission. Um, Lucia Pietruski, Pietrusti, sorry, <laughs> who is the public programmes um, curator at the Serpentine Gallery in London, and Sabine bubek Paz, who's the commissioning editor from ZDF and Arte, and they deal with international co-productions, commissions, and acquisitions. And the form that this will take is I've asked each of the panel members to have about 15 minutes to introduce themselves and the kind of work that they have commissioned, the kind of things they might be looking for, which I thought would be interesting. And, um, and I might do a little bit of follow-up questions and we'll have time at the end um, for you to ask your questions as well. So we're going to start with Jan Younghusband from the BBC. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sheffield. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. It's an amazing uh, schedule of events uh, ahead, so have a wonderful time. Um, it's a great honour to be here, and uh, thank you, Penny, for inviting me and Martin. Um, Penny and I go way back uh, doing what you might call art on TV, <laughs> um, and now I'm um, head of music commissioning at the BBC, um, so I just wanted to say quickly sort of who does what, a practical thing, uh, where we commission. I've got um, a, a four-minute reel of stuff which explains everything we do. Um, and uh, then I wanted to say a few words about, you know, how do you, how do you kind of do something interesting in a TV schedule? Uh, because I think one of the most difficult things for filmmakers is, you, you know, you want to make films, you want to make great stories, you want to do something different. But how can you land your idea uh, into a TV schedule, which sometimes can be quite predictable and formulaic? Um, okay, so who are we? Um, well, uh, I am the, the head of music television. I work uh, alongside me as Mark Bell, who is the head of arts television. The reason why there, it's split in two is because we do about 500 hours of arts and music programmes a year. And it's just too much for one person. Whereas at Channel 4, you will have John Hay, who, who, who does the whole thing. Um, working with us is the Commissioner Greg Sanderson, who works for Music and Arts, so for me and Mark. Um, and then we just have new onto our team, um, Kate Townsend, who you'll know from Storyville. And uh, Kate is working with me um, on theatrical docs, because a very, very important part of our output is the big sort of theatrical rock docs. And we're looking very much uh, to be on the front foot with these going forward, um, you know, we tend to get offered them down the line for acquisition and then we can't kind of get them because they're in a cinema window or whatever. Uh, but we're very, very keen to be more on the front foot and invest up front with those. Um, last year we created something called BBC Music. Um, the idea behind that was that if you looked at the BBC, which of course has radio online and everything and a load of music, 
Uh, it was like spaghetti, really. It was just music everywhere. Because there's music in Imagine, in Arena, sometimes a bit in Storyville, then there's all the stuff I do, then there's sometimes there's music in Arts, and then there's all the radio stations, and now they're streaming the radio stations. So they decided they would create BBC Music, being, hoping like BBC Sport, BBC News, that this would be a one-stop shop for the audience, so that the audience could come to that and find everything they want in music there. Um, the, so they've appointed the director of BBC Music, uh, Bob Shannon. Um, he is also the controller of Radio 2 and 6 Music. So he, um, and around him is a whole body and group of uh, management to manage the music as it comes into the BBC. So when you make your documentary, um, it won't, you, know, you have your documentary on BBC 2 or BBC 4. Um, BBC Music will come around your documentary and create all the other bits... Uh, so they can, you can attach to a radio station particularly. They'll make radio content alongside it. You can play out extra material online. Uh, they do archive collections. You know, so it's not, there's so much more to it than just the, the, the film itself. Um, so what do we commission? Well, we commission across all the channels. But we've had a shift lately because uh, BBC Three, as you may know, has changed and uh, or is changing and so uh, it's not going to be, it's not a, a TV channel in a straightforward sense anymore. It's a digital channel. And this means that it's looking to um, commission different shapes of content, sort of short form content. And it now has a, a sort of big link with Radio 1. And Radio 1 has, now has something called Radio 1 TV. <laughs> so they are making their own TV, except it's not on TV, it's online. Um, so the terminology gets confusing because by television we mean something visual. <laughs> and uh, so Radio 1 TV is filming itself, making short films, and is aiming to speak to the younger audience and it also has a platform on the new BBC Three. Um, BBC One is very much the entertainment channel. Uh, so there you would see The Voice, um, Strictly... Um, I don't commission those types of programmes if you have a big entertainment format and if you do, bring it on because we love to have them. If you've got the next Strictly, you know, we will love you. Um, but I don't do those sort of huge entertainment formats. Um, however, uh, what I do do on BBC One is um, I work with Imagine, with Alan Yentob, uh, to make rock docs for Imagine. Um, I, we also... Um, acquire and pre, you know, pre, pre-purchase rock docs and invest in rock docs to go on BBC One. Uh, so, for instance, the Beyonce film and you know, but big star films. Um, if Chris Martin shoots his concert, that would go on to BBC One at Christmas Day. Um, and then, of course, the new thing on BBC One is the Music Awards, which we started last Christ- Christmas, which is a new award show to celebrate British talent. Uh, BBC Two and Four work together. Um, um, they love to sort of work in partnership. So what you'll see between two and four is BBC Four doing a series and then there'll be what we're calling a tent pole. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of the Saturday night tent poles on BBC Two, which are big single films that are an hour or 90 minutes, which are the sort of, uh, which connect to the series. So, for example, we did a series about the 18th century on BBC Four and alongside that we made a big film uh, about the Messiah at the Foundling Hospital And these big BBC Two films are part history, part music. Um, And BBC Four is the the sort of home of music for us. This is the fans' channel. Uh, You know, the rock docs on Friday nights at 9 o'clock are completely, you know, uh, are absolutely adored by our audience. And uh, so Friday nights is a big music night on BBC Four. Um, And uh, you will see there, you know, the the thing that our audience loves, which is looking back at the past, fabulous archive, really interesting uh, discussion about music and history of music. So um, I've got um, a, a showreel to show you, a little showreel. Uh, so I thought, you know, Saturday morning, it's quite early, you might like some nice music, cheer us up. So we'll look at that, it's about four minutes. It starts with um, a little snippet of God Only Knows, which was the trailer we made for... Um, BBC uh, for the launch of BBC Music you will see on this the relationship we have with the artists which we pride ourselves in because you've got artists sort of flying from chandeliers and things in this thing Um, anyway there's a snippet of that then there are some clips uh, just to give you a taster of the sort of range of stuff we do so um, so that 
So what you see there really is the, the, the key thing that we look for is to put the artist centre screen. And uh, there's a clip there of the Genesis film. We got Genesis to speak. And, uh, you know, the, the, this is the thing that the BBC prides itself in, is getting the real story from the real people. When I joined the BBC five years ago, uh, quite an important art, we're a very famous artist, said to me, why do you always get those journalists on television talking about how things were when they weren't even there? And so what we try to do is to get access to the great artists to tell their stories. Um, the other thing you see on there is a lot of archive. Now, we have a lot of archive, and our audience loves archive. They like great stories, and they like great context. Um, and they like to see our archive. So we love to make films that look at um, how can we use that archive and how can we use that archi archive to tell the story in a new way. So great storytelling is incredibly important, but a new lens into that story. So, for example, um, we wanted to make a film about Messiah, the Messiah, Handel's Messiah. Now, if we'd made a film about Handel's Messiah, the music, um, very, very few people would have watched that. It would have been small for the audience. But instead, we made a film about what Messiah had to do with the Foundling Hospital, because all music has a context in life. You know, it's not just there because it's fun. It's there because it's sort of inspired... The artists are inspired to write it because they're people living in the world. So we made a film about the Messiah at the Foundling Hospital and, how, um, um, and the effect it had, which was kind of like the first charitable performance. And that film was part history, presented by Amanda Vickery, and part music, um, presented by Tom Service. And the effect of that was, instead of it being a film about the Messiah, which about 200,000 people have watched, uh, nearly 2 million people watched that film because they came to it because our audience loves historical... They love the context of it, the historical context. Um, the last thing to say, I suppose, is that I... Uh, and I'd love to have questions from you later about how can you put something that you might call art on television in the way that they used to in the rock world make Yellow Submarine or, you know, those great films that they made. And I think it's, it is possible to do that. But the thing is, is the way you present it and how you find your way into that space. Um, I think that television inevitably is slightly formulaic when you deal with volume. Uh, of course, you ha you're filling slots and you have to do certain things that need to be done. But every year in the middle of all that are you know, half a dozen really interesting films. And how you find that and how you find how to put that on television needs a lot of thought. Um, and I'd love to have questions from you on that later. Thank you. I think um, Jan did say that I could ask her the tough questions that people might be afraid to ask in the audience, but I think we'll move on to the other speakers, and then um, I will definitely bludgeon you um, <laughs> bludgeon at the end. Um, but I'd like to introduce David now from Foreman to talk about um, his work. Good morning. Um, well, probably, probably most of you don't know Performer's work. We're an arts organisation based in London, and we commission and produce new projects with artists, starting from the very genesis of the idea through to um, completion and onward touring. Um, the, the works we produce are quite varied. We really specialise in, in works that kind of cross the boundaries between art forms or cross the boundaries between art and science, or art and technology. Um, and we try and initiate projects that are... Um, kind of meaningful, we'll find a, a, a kind of real connection with an audience in the real world um, and we try and support artists in developing or exploring new ways of working. Um, so uh, we work internationally as well as in the UK and we commit, I guess we are unusual as a commissioning organisation in that we kind of don't really um, control the kind of, the, the way in which those projects find their audience because we're always building partnerships for the project. So um, our partnership most closely is with the artist um, and then we build partner partnerships around the project to enable it to happen in the real world, in, in festivals, um, in theatres, in concert halls, in galleries and museums. Um, so I've got a little uh, clip of a few different projects that um, we can show just to, and I can then talk a little bit about how we commissioned each of those just as some examples. Okay, so the first of those pieces, um, Datamatics by Ryoji Okeda, 
um, was commissioned as an as a audiovisual concert piece originally in 2006. Um, we worked with the AV Festival in the Northeast, uh, with the Centre Pompidou and with Zero One in San Jose um, to commission it. It was developed over a series of iterations, actually. The, the premiere was half an hour long and then we managed to raise some more money from another partner to kind of extend it through to a full-length piece of work. Um, and it's, despite being uh, nine years old already, um, it still gets out and tours quite a lot internationally. It's, it's a piece that's been quite, um, quite widely seen around the world. Um, the second piece, Jane Louise Wilson, was a, was a project that we uh, initiated with them um, to make a whole body of work around the legacy of the Chernobyl disaster. Um, and the film element was one part of, one part of a bo that body of work, which also included photography and sculpture. Uh, we worked with Film London to support the commission for the film and also the Arts Council, uh, and the project was supported a bit by the British Council in, in Kiev. Uh, I know there's a contingent from the British Council in Ukraine around this festival. Um, the work was shown at the Whitworth Gallery in Manchester um, and has then been shown in film festivals. And this is quite common for the work we produce, that it has kind of quite a few different versions or, or, or outlets in a way. So the Datamatics piece by Ryoji became a gallery installation in, in um, Tokyo, a kind of 10 screen installation version of that piece, um, but primarily exists as a live thing. Um, Jane Louise's piece primarily is being shown as a film actually, rather than a gallery installation. And the final piece by Dryden Goodwin um, is from a 12-part film called Skill. We are um, leading uh, a program of audience development-focused commissions in the Northeast um, at the moment in East Durham. And one of the things that people told us from East Durham about the art that they kind of respected or kind of connected with was that they valued things, things that had a demonstrable skill. So we invited Dryden as a very skilled um, artist in terms of his drawings, um, but also as a filmmaker, um, to come up with an idea to, um, to respond to that. Um, and his, his idea was kind of to turn it a little bit, the question a little bit back on the communities and, and ask them to nominate people from those areas um, who had a particular manual skill or kind of um, a local skill. So that, that piece obviously is somebody who's um, training in racing pigeons. Um, and Dryden kind of composed this 12-part film where he, he kind of created a portrait uh, on camera and through conversation with, with each, of those, um, each of those 12 people. Uh, and we presented that in the Northeast in, kind of a, in a film kind of context and in kind of touring it to small-scale uh, community centres and so on around the area and did some big public projections of it. Um, the next phase of it is to actually show it in a kind of museum context uh, along with another new work that he's made recently. Um, so our projects tend to be quite long-term um, commitments to artists, really, and um, they evolve and, and develop and find their audiences over quite a long, t long period of time. So I thought it might be interesting just to very quickly mention how we select the projects that we produce. Um, mostly... We're initiating those projects and we're, we're kind of going and in, inviting an artist who we want to begin a conversation with us about a project to, to start thinking about um, what we might do together. Um, but we do occasionally respond to people proposing ideas to us. Um, those have to be quite early stage ideas. We never really get involved in a project if it's already kind of fully formed and just looking for somebody to put in a bit of money or put in a little bit of um, support to make it happen. Um, we like to work really collaborative, co collaboratively with the artists we work with. Um, so if anybody wants to um, propose a project to us, um, by all means, con contact us by email with, it, with a kind of outline of, of something which isn't kind of fully developed and just, just ready to go. Um, and expect to have a conversation with us about kind of how we develop that together. Um, and, yeah, the, the next step is probably a meeting, talking about the possibilities if it's something that we decide is going to work for us and can, we can envisage a way to support financially because, it's, if, as I said, it's all about partnerships for us and who we can work with to support a project happening uh, and one that we can envisage finding, uh, finding a, a route to an audience in the world, then, then we would very, well, very much welcome that conversation.
Great. Well, those are two very different and completely fascinating <laughs> introductions. Um, so I'd like to move on to Lucia now from the Serpentine Gallery. I need, a, I need a prop. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And personally, it's a real pleasure and honor also to be sitting uh, amongst those individuals that are, uh, you know, really the, the forces behind lots and lots of projects that I've also admired. Um, so even just that is a treat for me. <laughs> um, uh, so my job title at the Serpentine Galleries is Public Programs Curator. And I guess um, what I'm going to do uh, a little bit here is talk about um, what that uh, involves in terms of commissioning a new work for the Serpentine and also how that may apply perhaps to other arts organizations uh, that, uh, whose, let's say, initial remit uh, is that of working with visual artists. But as I'm sure we've all uh, experienced, uh, the distinctions between disciplines, as they become more and more blurred, all organizations and institutions uh, become more and more, uh, their programs become more and more uh, varied and multidisciplinary as well in reaction to that. Um, so public programs at the Serpentine is uh, a sort of uh, in a crossover, uh, uh, let's say, department or discipline that works very closely with uh, the exhibitions uh, programs and also with the education programs, but it mainly uh, produces and invites uh, uh, participants to produce time-based work. So as, um, uh, as, a, as broad a category as that is, time-based works then in include uh, music performances, dance performances, um, visual arts performance and film. Uh, my own background is in, was, I suppose, in literature and as such I had to make that kind of interdisciplinary shift in my own uh, profession in order to uh, uh, enter this, uh, enter into this uh, job. And so uh, that, those kinds of uh, blurring of formats uh, and mediums are not unfamiliar um, uh, to me, and they're probably the main reason why I'm involved in, in this. Um, broadly, uh, how things, how live uh, programming is program is <laughs> is uh, organized into series at the Serpentine is uh, via uh, different uh, kind of driving principles. Uh, every year we hold an event called the um, the marathon. It is an event that was initiated by the co-director of the Serpentine called hans Ulrich Oberth. Marathons are uh, two-day continuous events uh, that bring together participants from the fields of literature, science, filmmaking, art, dance. Uh, I may have forgotten a few. Uh, and uh, to, to uh, respond to a particular theme or topic that feels uh, like it uh, holds particular relevance uh, in, in cultural discourses of the time. So what you're seeing on screen now is actually a moment from the Memory Marathon of 2012, which again invited uh, uh, all sorts of people to, um, uh, to respond to the idea of memory. And uh, one of the questions that we were asking at the time, of course 2012 is a little bit uh, the advent of, or the moment at which everybody started to have uh, uh, touchscreen phones, and, uh, or at least most people ended up having touchscreen phone after that year. Um, and also a moment that was particularly interesting from a sort of sociocultural point of view because of uh, uh, it, the ripples of the global financial crisis becoming to be f starting to be felt, you know, really in people's homes. And so uh, the qu questions around memory, identity, surveillance, amnesia, um, and how all of those played a part in uh, cultural discourses uh, felt particularly important for us. Um, here is just to show you the range of the different things that are. Um, presented at a marathon event and these include films um, uh, as well as other kinds of commissions. This is uh, Tarek Atui uh, in a musical performance. This is John Berger in an interview and this is a short film that David Lynch uh, uh, prepared for us uh, which I think was called No Santa Claus 
and you can see it online and you'll see exactly why it's called No Santa Claus. Um, what I wanted probably uh, to focus on the most to do with the marathon events is this idea of expanded cinema. Uh, a term that was coined in the 1960s by an experimental filmmaker, Stan van der Beek, uh, to, design, to d refer to uh, f filmic practices and cinema practices that um, consider the context of their uh, presentation as part of the work itself. So anything from <clears throat> excuse me, a sound, an, a, an installation of a film within a wider sort of sculptural installation in a gallery or um, a work where the, the filmic medium itself, the, the film itself, uh, becomes, uh, it becomes part of uh, the elements of a work that need to be considered. Uh, and this that you see here is, I, I would consider, a piece of uh, visualized performance but also uh, expanded cinema uh, by uh, an artist called uh, Ed Atkins, whom I'm sure some of you here are going to be f familiar with. Um, it's called Depression. And I was hoping to maybe play a very, very short little clip so that you could see what it looks like. Um, perhaps the clip from about minute 3 and 38. Um, so w one of the things that I was saying is that part of the remit as public programs is uh, to work with artists who are perhaps at an early stage of their career, w uh, which uh, makes it a lot uh, easier to commission a completely new uh, piece of work um, um, without necessarily having the sort of obligation to fill an entire gallery space with a life's worth of work. Part of uh, what we do then is, is support artists at a very local context, so UK-based artists, and then invite some international artists in order to make sure that we have an ongoing kind of discussion and conversations. Um, I promised myself I would answer the question, who makes the decisions, which was one of Penny's uh, questions. And I have to probably at that point admit that the decision-making of an art institution is quite a distributed process. Um, that there isn't, at least at the Serpentine, there isn't a, a sort of open call um, a format, it's invitation based uh, usually, but that if you are a visual artist and you are keen on showing your work, then what I would always encourage you to do um, is uh, to write to a curator, make a personal connection and invite them to do a studio visit or to see the work with them the moment you get to spend an hour and a half with uh, someone who works in an art organisation, you'll see that the conversation becomes extremely sort of rich and fruitful and a lot of the times those things result in, in um, you know, commissions or, or some kind of ongoing dialogue. Um, I wanted to talk about a little bit the, uh, uh, the change of form. This is um, actually a shot from the marathon that we ran, ran last year, um, which was on the topic of extinction. Um, and there is a brilliant filmmaker called Benedict Drew who uh, uh, made a new piece especially for this um, which I will show you at the end. But I wanted to also... Uh, this is Lily Cole reading a Yoko Ono piece of the Extinction Marathon. Uh, and this is from Benedict's uh, piece. I wanted to talk just ever so briefly about the Park Night series, which is a series of performances, screenings, concerts, and other live events that we hold each year in the Serpentine Pavilion, which is a commissioned a commission to a different architect every year and it sits on the Serpentine Gallery's lawn. This, what you see here is the structure that was um, on the lawn in uh, last year from about June to about October. Park nights uh, are a way of experiencing that structure in, uh, in the evening, the only moments at which the audience can experience those structures in the evening and also a way of inviting practitioners from all sorts of disciplines to respond to an architectural space. So what you see here is a film, a music work that uh, Haroon Mirza uh, and Mark Fell um, uh, brought together and several elements of this film installation, one night only film installation and concert, uh, were projected onto different uh, uh, surfaces of the pavilion itself. Again, the invitation is always to respond to the structure and this was a way of making film uh, be an installation investigation of texture, the texture of the building itself. I wanted to also show you this image because I think it's quite lovely. This is the pavilion of 2013 uh, that was designed by Sue Fujimoto. And inside what you see is a screen um, 
that we put up in order to show the films of the brilliant <coughs> filmmaker Leslie Thornton um, uh, in this context. So sometimes it's just the mixing of an, uh, the sort of bringing together of an architectural context and someone's work that makes this uh, that, that makes the park nights really unique. They also happen for, as I said, one night, and so. Um, I mean, they, they, they end up feeling quite special, at least to me. <laughs> um, the, the other platforms, other kinds of architectural structures, the digital ones, uh, this is a work commissioned to the artist Cecile B. Evans for the Serpentine website. She uh, invented, designed, and recorded and produced a sort of spam bot uh, called Agnes that lives in the infrastructure of the website and shows you content, uh, either from the website or other content that she filmed and brought together. So uh, as you sort of click, clicked, because now it is no longer uh, up on, on uh, Agnes, uh, she would uh, show you anything from uh, you know, Wikipedia articles through to you know, a cat in the basement of the Serpentine Gallery itself. So this idea that the spam bot could take you around uh, the, the behind the scenes of an institution and that that behind the scenes uh, is, is a kind of imaginary, a, a place of imagination, a place of research, and also a place of sort of digital infrastructure. Uh, Cecile B. Evans, incidentally, was the first of uh, collaboration with Sheffield Dog Fest um, because uh, the festival then invited uh, Cecile to present a performance film that we did together um, where Agnes gets interviewed by the curator of digital at the Serpentine. And we presented it here last year. And the second person... Uh, that was uh, invited as a result of this collaboration is this year is the artist Heather Philipson. You see here the Park Nights performance and film that she presented at the um, Park Night series of last year, so in the same structure that you saw earlier. Uh, out of that came a commission uh, that uh, is presented here in Sheffield uh, these days, which I would encourage you all to see. Um, uh, the, uh, it's, it's an installation uh, at the old uh, shopping mall of or the old co-op at Castle House. Uh, and it's a multi-channel, multi-screen, multi-film and watermelon installation, uh, of which I would really very much like to show you a clip. Um, it's a really fantastic exhibition and I really would encourage you all to um, to visit it. Um, in order to show you a clip, I will cut that, this, um, my other comments a little bit uh, short, but if there's anything that I haven't addressed that you were expecting that I would, I'll be happy to do that in questions. Would it be okay to show this? Sure. Could we show the, the clip called Final Days Pants? So the exhibition of uh, Heather Phillipson is called Final Days. Um, that's obviously a pun on uh, between sort of the I'll get there, the apocalypse and, um, and the final days of a sale. Uh, the installation is in this m mall which has been abandoned, uh, or is, sorry, is, is no longer in use, and so it's a kind of derelict building. Um, and she uh, created these different departments, uh, so to speak. Um, so, last but not least, there's uh, Sabine from ZDF Arte. Hi, everybody. Um, morning. So um, I'm not sure if all of you are um, know what, what Arte is doing and uh, how the structure of Arte is working. So I wanted to ask you um, how many of you did already got an introduction to this German-French TV system? Okay, so... Some of you might be a little bit bored now because I will um, invite you on another trip into this uh, so-called Arte galaxy, um, which, is, which means that Arte is not anymore just TV, but it's, uh, it's more than that. It's, uh, um, yeah, I will show you. Uh, so maybe we start with the, with the PowerPoint. Um, uh, by the way, Arte... Um, you might think that arts is uh, included in the in the name of the channel, but it's very banal. It's Association Relative à la Télévision Européenne, but it sounds like art. <laughs> I like art. 
So, um, yeah, just uh, follow me on this, on this trip. I'm commissioning editor within this, um, this structure, this German-French structure, um, which is called European Culture Channel. And you all have to know if you want to, if you're going to work with us as documentary filmmakers or producers, you have to know that um, it's a German-French channel at the basis of, of, the, of the structure. So um, if you work with us, you have to think about two audiences, uh, one audience in Germany and uh, the other in France, which... Uh, is not always uh, where people don't have the same knowledge about art, who don't know the same names. So we have always to be sure that your, pro your projects, your ideas are working for um, two audiences at least. Um, so if you're coming from the UK, if you're coming from uh, outside, maybe also outside Europe, um, Uh, you, you might, it might be interesting for you to think about um, who are those people there and what do they know uh, and who, they, who, who do they know. On Arte, um, there are all arts, including cinema, theater, music, painting, architecture, comics, and we really understand art and culture as, as, part, as part of life. I think that is, that is very important. We are interested in, in stories. We are interested in understanding um, yeah, arts, arts at, as, as, a part, as a part of our daily life also, and not only talking about life, but also making life so quality. Quality, docu quality documentary filmmaker is really at the basis of everything. So we, as I said, we have, we have arts on air, we have arts online, and what is uh, in, within this art galaxy very, very important to understand, and uh, the, the term of cross-media, transmedia, appeared on the panel several times, and I think that's for us More, more and more important. Um, and for me, as a commissioning editor, this, this gives us a lot of possibilities um, to work in, in different ways. Well, it creates also uh, new problems and new challenges, but I think the, the, the creative policy possibilities for, um, for us to work together and to, to use very different documentary formats Is, is growing, and for me it's kind of, um, because I'm doing that job since more than 20 years now, uh, it's a kind of fresh, fresh air. And when we, when we were just talking about, um, uh, about tendencies in, in, the, in the moment, I think it's really interesting to see that, that the media are merging and, and working together suddenly in a, in, a, in a very interesting new way. So I think for, for all of us, for you and, and those working within the channel. Um, it's really a creative time and um, it's time to, to, um, yeah, to, to understand and to grab those new possibilities. So just to give you a little, it might be confusing, so it's the, 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 the schedule of, of Arte. Um, uh, I just mark those uh, program slots with, with red where I'm involved in, in as, a, as a commissioning editor. Um, I'm not specialized uh, on, on, on arts and culture in a, in a proper sense, so I'm not, not doing music programs, I'm not doing a theater program, but I'm working on, on all the, um, not all, but a lot of the, the evening slots on art, uh, um, and I will show you. No, I wanted to skip that because it's really confusing. Um, uh, the, to show you, to give you, to give you an overview a little bit about the, the most important documentary slots, and um, on uh, working in a proper sense for on 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 on, uh, on art, um, because there there are many of them, and and you can uh, with your programs. 
I think it might be interesting for you to go to the uh, to the Arte website and uh, also for the non-German or French-speaking people, there there are introductions about uh, program slots about the the philosophy of Arte that can be really interesting for you. I wanted to. Um, to focus on first of all on one slot which is really which is really interesting um, on Sunday evenings concerning uh, portraits of artists of um, well let's say um, internationally at least in Germany in France there starts the problem because if we if we talk about um, important or, or interesting and well known people who you can portray on a Sunday evening when, when German and French people are sitting together most of the time there are English names coming, coming into discussion and that is a little bit a problem for, for that slot um, I'm, I might, um, it might be interesting uh, because we had I, I give you one example um, maybe it's good to show that clip about Ingrid, Ingrid Bergman if you can, if you can open that one. It's a portrait uh, that we just, it's just been finished. It's uh, been shown in, uh, in Cannes this year because they have this um, documentary, um, documentary prize there now and this uh, documentary program. And um, it's been made with, um, for the 100th birthday of, of Ingrid Bergman uh, in, uh, in the end of August. And it's a Swedish, it's for once not an, not an English name, but for sure she was working in Hollywood and uh, uh, a lot of people know her. So please start. I just show you the beginning to show you the, the tone. So this film, I just wanted to give you an impression of the possibilities here because it's a portrait about this, this, this actress. Um, but it's, all also, um, it's, it's, it's also very personal personal portrait. So for us it's, it's important to have this very, um, this very author, author driven films there and uh, this very special and individual perspective on, on, on artists' life. Um, so as I said so, no, no. so th that was for Documania on a Sunday evening. So then we have for sure cultural documentaries um, uh, which are more contextualizing, which are more um, analytics, but, but also I will not be able to show you the clip. I brought you the film uh, which we did here for that slot uh, about Claude Lanzmann, but you will be able to see it here in the festival because Adam Benzein will have his, um, uh, his European premiere here um, in the festival, so you will be able to see it there. It's no need to, to show you the clip. Uh, we have pop cultural documentaries um, on, on, on TV and we have for sure also portray, uh, portraits uh, of, of, um, of uh, musicians. Uh, we have, uh, document uh, we have um, arts magazine, culture magazine like Metropolis and uh, pop cultural magazines like Tracks. These are just some examples for slots where you can find um, art and culture on, on Arte. And also um, a funny, very funny, in my eyes, a very funny and interesting format, which is Into the Night With, where you have a, a couple, a team, two people sit, sitting together in a car and di discovering um, uh, a city by night together and talking about what they're doing in their, uh, in their uh, arts. Um, so then, for sure, we have a very important um, poll of uh, in the our planet in the in the Arte galaxy is Arte Online, where you can see in the headline all the different platforms we have there. We have the the for sure where you can see TV Live. We have the um, we have Arte Creative, where which which is which is in the moment restructuring itself, where. Um, there are a lot of projects with with artists themselves going going on. It's a participative platform, and we have Arte Concert, which is very uh, very well accepted by all all the ages. So young people, older people, 
who are looking, who are uh, watching their live concerts, um, classical but also pop co pop uh, concerts. <coughs> so um, I'm hurrying a little bit. Um, that's Arte Arte Creative uh, that I already mentioned. So and just let's go back to the structure of Arte. I'm sitting on the, the German side of Arte, in Ar on, on the Arte Germany side, at the ZDF in Mainz. Uh, but as you can see, there are different doors that you can, where you can enter the Arte system. You can enter it by Arte France or you can enter it by Arte Germany. Um, and uh, the fact is that the, the, the important thing is that all the, the, pro the projects, all the program which are co-produced by Arte France and Arte Germany, they go to Arte, so-called Arte Gaie, uh, which is the, our headquarter, let's say, uh, in Strasbourg. And there for you as, as producers and filmmakers, it's, there is a very important institution, which is the Conference of Programs. And all the arts programs, all the cultural programs, all the, every, every project that we are proposing to Arte has to be accepted by this Conference of Programs. So uh, that's a very important point for you, all of you, that if you work with people uh, in, in France or in, in, in Germany, only when the Conference of Programs says yes and gives you green light, it's, it's okay and the, the, the production, co-production can start. So um, I'm working at the ZDF department, Thema Arte. Um, all the programs that, that I think are great and I'm in love with, I have to present it to our uh, ZDF coordinator for Arte, who is called Wolfgang Bergmann. And he's the one, he's the one uh, who will take it to over out of Germany uh, to Strasbourg and, and there to the, to the conference of programs and he has to defend it. So that means for you that um, you, your written proposal has to be really very um, clear, attractive, seducing, um, because it's, it's the paper that will, that will travel to Strasbourg and try to convince those people sitting there every month, um, every first, um, first week of the month, they are sitting together there for two days and discussing all the projects. So that's why I'm, and I think a lot of my colleagues, are very fond of, of well-written proposals. So... Um, And going with that, because we were asked also to, to say how, we, how you can bring in your work, um, it's the well-written proposal for sure, the, the DVD, and then you send it to me or send by post or by email. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you to everybody. It's um, really fascinating that at one level you can think there's a sort of huge chasm between the creative freedom that you would have with David and Lucia, and then, in a sense, the, you know, the, the BBC and possibly Arte and ZDF um, are offering, although it seems that there perhaps is a bit more flexibility, I'm not sure, you know, with Arte. There's a lot of flexibility. A lot of flexibility in terms of the creative content. Um, I'm very aware that there's only 15 minutes left, so if you're bursting to ask questions, please shoot your hands up, otherwise I will ask a question. Okay? Yeah. One of the great worries for supplicants of all kinds, whether they're producers or idea generators, in the arts area, now that it's very much more inclusive and you have fancy words like cultural discourse and the notion that art is what an artist declares it to be, is what you don't do, either in terms of genre, and you might say, well, read our stuff, but it isn't that clear, either in terms of genre or approach. People waste a lot of time on commissioners they oughtn't to be talking to. How could that be made clearer? Bad stuff though it may be, people put their little hearts into it and spend a lot of time sending off proposals, making conversations, 
in the wrong places. And the borderlines now of what constitutes art are really terribly porous. You know, we were talking about you know, where art shades off into politics, shades off into economics. We had some examples there. What should somebody do, you know, if they were quite conscientious, to make sure they weren't making an approach that wasted the commissioner's time and wasted their own time? <laughs> well, I was hoping that somehow hearing from the, the people on this panel, you get an idea of the kinds of things that they would commission. But it is bewildering, I agree. Well, I, I think I could say that. And I, actually, I wouldn't yeah. mind, in fact, asking yeah. the bit the tough question, because... It, it's not just who to approach, but mm. I think many of us find the BBC very mystifying in terms of it only seems to be the channel controller who can make a final decision about anything and that nobody seems to be able to commission things in the way that perhaps it sounds. You were very transparent about the fact that people have to go through these hoops and then there's a final hoop at which you say yes, and that's pretty clear whereas it's, it's not very clear with the BBC where you see people and then the decision gets passed up and up and up and up and then eventually you're, it disappears into the mists of you know, some kind of bureaucratic process, which I think is partly what you're referring to. Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's a really, you know, really important question because uh, how do you make the approach? Um, sometimes people approach me and they just haven't, thought at all about what we do and sometimes haven't even watched the programmes or so sometimes I think well do you ever watch Friday night on BBC4 do you have any um, I love it when people come to me and say I've been looking at what you're doing and actually I think you could do it differently and that is the gold dust for us uh, when people come in who are informed about what we're doing and then see another way of doing it and, you know, there aren't billions of brilliant new ideas all the time. You know, out of a lot of ideas come a very few really brilliant ones. But you kind of need a lot of ideas to find the really brilliant one. Um, to me, the art is in the craft of the filmmaking. And, you know, is it art on television? What, I don't really know what that means, actually. I mean, I've asked artists to make television. And uh, all I can tell you is you have to be really robust if you want to make something called an arts programme. Uh, because in my entire career I've never made anything that anyone wanted. Uh, so you have to be robust and persuasive and you have to speak the right language to do it. So if you come in saying, oh, the trouble is the BBC never does any arts programmes, you know, you go, well, well, actually we do. And what do you mean by that anyway? Um, so, for instance, the BBC just did the slow season um, and more and more, you know, we're talking about can we break up the schedule, can we be less formulaic, you know, how can we break up the schedule? But with the BBC, um, obviously we're spending your money, uh, public money, and there's an expectation that we will deliver some kind of value for money, which is seen as volume, right, which I personally disagree with. I mean, I don't think just because we've done 300 hours of television we've made anything you want to watch, but you know, it's about the individual thing. But I think in terms of the decision, the decisions are taken... Uh, the, 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 you come to the commissioner and you, they say, yes, we like your idea, we're going to take it to the channel. The channel is a very complex thing. It hasn't just got arts programmes on it, it's got lots of other programmes. And funny little things like, you know, would you think Wimbledon would make any difference to your life? Well, I can tell you it nearly destroyed Glastonbury when Andy Murray was winning, because uh, Glastonbury was meant to be on BBC One, and then suddenly Wimbledon was on BBC One, so Glastonbury had to come off BBC One and go on BBC Two. And, you know, so it's a, it's a lot of other things going on, apart from just the arts programme. So when you go into the channel with your brilliant arts idea, I will go in with it. Sometimes we take the filmmaker in with it. If, it's, if I feel I can't talk about it, I take the producers in with me. And we discuss the idea. And then the thing is, where's it going to fit? Uh, and then, you know, if you just make one single little arts programme and you bunged it into the BBC schedule, frankly, it would get lost. So we try to work in seasons, and we think, oh, that's an interesting idea. Could we build a season around it? Could we work with a V&A on this? Could we work with a Serpentine? Could it be an exhibition outside as well? So quite a lot of... It takes time, so quite a lot of discussion goes on about how's it going to really fit? How can we really land it? So, that, so I don't want to make programmes that nobody watches, and it's not just about viewing figures, but it's about... I want to make things that people are excited about and they want to see. And so sometimes it's about how do you land it in the territory when it's the middle of Wimbledon and nobody's going to watch it. Um, so the reason why there are... When I go to the channel, when they say, right, yes, we like this idea, 
there is a thing called two ticks. The reason why there are two ticks is because um, it's so that the, um, the, the channel controller, who is responsible ultimately for that channel and how it works and will be fired if it's not working, um, has a right to say if they want the program or not. So there are two ticks. There's if I like the program, we go and discuss it. And then if the channel agrees that this program will work in the channel, we can make it work, they will, they will tick it as well. And it's done really for the security of the channel, not just to be difficult. And the reason why we take time to make decisions is precisely that, that you will come in with your perfect arts idea and we'll say, gosh, that really fits with the serpentine. You know, let's go to the serpentine gallery. Maybe they'll put on an exhibition. So that Bowie clip was actually, we did that Bowie film with the V&A and they did that huge exhibition at the V&A. A lot of our stuff was in that exhibition. We had access to the archive. They had access to the archive. It was totally authored by the man himself, but it's sort of from the back room kind of thing. And that's how we work. And so that's why it takes time. Yeah. Can I, can I just give you a very practical advice? Uh, because because uh, I, I, know, I know that there is uh, this confusion and it's very difficult and it's, it's hard work really to, to grab exactly those people who could be a good partner with you uh, working on a certain project. There is this EDN guide, uh, which, is, which is a guide with, with addresses and with profiles of people working, working in TV And you can really do your homework in quite an easy way. You go through, you check it, you, you, you do your researches online, and then you can already filter in a very practical way the, the, the people who could be interesting for you. I think that's... I think that's really two great answers, actually. You had a question. Um, is there a microphone? Yeah, for the commissioners, just thinking around development budgets, whether there's a whether they exist and where you would find them and who you would talk to about them, basically. Uh, yeah, to the commissioner, um, we do have development budgets, and development's very important. If you can submit your idea, um, basically, you know, we we have a system called Pitch where you submit your idea. Um, you can submit your idea with one line. Uh, and if it's sort of exciting and gripping enough, we think, oh, that's a good idea. But you can say, you know, I've had this idea, and it's clear that it needs development. And development's a very important part of our work. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. We, don't, we don't have, for example, uh, development budgets, but I know that Art de France has development bud budgets, but if you have a good producer, they will know how you can get um, into media development funds, etc., etc. Yeah. Microphone, yes. uh, quite a few of the panel uh, have mentioned museums, uh, engagement with museums, and I I'm just wondering if you might sort of characterize what some of those uh, engagements are a bit more beyond just seeing the museum as a, perhaps a unique space where you know, whatever it is being produced could be displayed. I mean, th does it extend beyond that? Can you, maybe David. Yeah, um, well, in, in the way that we work with museums, generally... I would, well, the, for us, the best way to work with a museum is as a, a co-commissioner of a project. So we initiate a project together, or we maybe initiate a project with an artist and then take it to a museum who get on board with it, which needs to be at an early stage, of course, because they don't want to just buy something off the shelf. But um, So, yeah, ideally, it's a collaborative um, relationship which supports the development of a new project. Alternatively, it might just be that they end up showing the work at the end of the day. Um, Lucia, did you...? Well, I, I think at this point I, th I probably should say that in a lot of cases in which we commission work, we as the, the you know, non-profit charity organization become part of the applicants for funding for those things. So even though we can provide some support, and we do as much as possible towards the commissioning of uh, a project, if that project is large scale, we obviously need to appeal to other funding bodies. So in that sense, uh, that position from commissioner shifts to the position of, let's say, co-producer, I guess, um, at a certain point in the process. The other thing that I would probably say, <clears throat> it's obviously difficult to see that when one is inside a museum, so I would kind of say, well, that's what we do every day, I don't know, but um, one of the things that I would probably say has to do with the engagement of a particular and different kind of audience, because something happens when you 
um, when you test a particular statement or an artwork or a project against an audience that is expecting a different kind of engagement. A person that wa walks into a gallery is different from a person that sort of goes to the cinema. One of the projects that we run to try and work that through is a project called Serpentine Cinema, which aims to show uh, artists' film and performance, so artists that work between film and performance in the cinema context. And we've done that across London at different cinemas, and you know each cinema has its own audience, and lots and lots of things change when you kind of move the context around. There's a question at the back. Hi, just uh, a question about the role of an artist and a filmmaker. Um, I think, Jan, uh, you mentioned that you had commissioned artists to make films, and I wondered whether that worked the other way, whether you know, galleries would, would commission filmmakers to make art, uh, not having had that sort of fine art or visual uh, mm. art production background. I mean, just... But, to jump in, I was approached by the Roundhouse and every um, other year they commission an artist to do something in the main space and they said, would you like the main space for three weeks to do whatever you want? And um, so I think it can work that way. But yeah. I think you have to sort of be a little bit, make an effort to be, not an effort, to be in that world, to see things, to be interested in art, to meet people, mm. to get out with your work so that you're not just having it being shown on TV and that's the end of it, you know, actually yeah. going out with your films and doing things and taking an interest in what's going on culturally beyond simply television so then people will be aware that you exist and then those offers because it can seem a little bit like a closed world mm. where David to some extent might be open to ideas and perhaps at the Serpentine mm. a bit less you know that uh, it tends to be more by invitation but the invitation comes if you're in the right place you know if you're visible somehow and again yeah oh mm. sorry I should say that you see in opera you know filmmakers going onto the stage actually Penny has has done that uh, so I think there's some interesting... If you're talking about the filmmaker going into the cultural organisation to make work, um, I think actually we see that happening. I mean, look, Mike Lee has just done an opera. You know, Penny's gone from to make operas, uh, actually because she made an opera on television, but mm. back into opera. Uh, and sometimes we've made art. Or, or I've commissioned new operas for the screen that have then gone back onto the stage. So... I, I think it, it does depend on the project, but one of the most exciting things, I think, is that the galleries and the arts organisations are commissioning their own work from filmmakers, and you can approach them directly. I mean, Covent Garden is its own production house now, is making all kinds of stuff that has nothing to do with us at the BBC, but, you know, the, um, we work regularly with all the galleries. Um, so I think you, as a filmmaker, I think you could approach the galleries. You know, it's a similar sort of process. Have you got an idea? And I would go and approach them. I mean, they want to hear from you. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree. I think even though a sort of formal open call processes are not are sort of few and far between when you talk about uh, at least visual art galleries uh, I receive emails from artists that say would you like to come and see my studio from filmmakers that say would you like to see my work and I really do make an effort to see and spend as much time as possible doing research this is part of what we do mm. as curators yeah, totally. um, the other thing that I wanted to make as an example is of course I speak from the point of view of someone who's committed to interdisciplinarity. So anyone, whether they're a filmmaker or a neuroscientist, is going to, you know, I'm going to try and familiarize myself with what they do in order to see how it would fit within a sort of general, more general cultural, again, cultural discourse. Um, and one of those examples is Adam Curtis, because actually Adam produced, Adam, who has made these extraordinary films for the BBC, produced several short films on, upon the invitation of the Serpentine. And part of the reason why is because he sort of, is, is sort of has an, a, an identity in terms of filmmaker that falls slightly out of the kind of traditional documentary filmmaking. It's, you know, these are essay films. These are films that make very strong comments about the uh, cultural situation that we find in ourselves. So Adam actually ended up having an exhibition in an exhibition space, Eflux, in New York, as an artist, in a sense. And he would always say, I'm not an artist, I'm a journalist. But, but these kind of distinctions get blurred with us. Um, just uh, to remind everybody, if you booked for um, the round table with the Arts Commission, that's going to happen in this room at 12.15 um, with the people here, so you'll have an opportunity to meet them if, if you've booked for it. Have we got a last question from anybody? Yep. 
I guess, yeah, it's just a more, um, if you can give a bit more information about stepping stone commissions or series that you do. There's a lot about, you know, uh, big artists and big directors you approach. But in terms of a young filmmaker, have you got series or shorts, funding projects or things like that that are coming up that people can actually, you know, apply to as a... As a nobody. <laughs> You're talking about yeah. television. Yeah, right? yeah. well, yeah. TV so and I mean, uh, yeah, Sabine, both really. Yeah. Okay, well, the BBC has lots of new stuff opening up because there's, uh, an, uh, there's the space, uh, which has been around for about a year and a half now. Um, you can approach BBC Arts. We're, we're really into short form content now, so um, BBC Arts Commission short form content. Um, there's also in BBC Music is uh, BBC Music is just beginning this summer to have a space in the iPlayer which can commission content of any duration um, and if you want to apply for that you're very welcome to write to me I mean I was going to say that actually if you don't know who to write to write to the person you do know <laughs> because we all sit in one bank you know like a call centre in you know new broadcasting houses Anyone who's been to visit me will know. Uh, we're all, I mean, like Mark Bell and I are side by side, so you know it's not. Uh, I don't even have to walk to speak to him. So if you send me something, say who do I who do I speak to? We can connect you. So you know, just feel free to do that. Yeah, I think I think it's 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 tricky for sure. I mean, uh, young filmmakers are very very welcome, but we all know that they need to be teamed up with experienced people and I think that's the important thing. If you have a great filmmaker with a great idea who is young and inexperienced, put them put him together or her together with a with an experienced team and it will be convincing, you know. We just have to be sure that the money that we invest is uh, well invested and well cared of, you know. And that's um, that's all. But for sure uh, that's why we're working there. We, we want to develop new talents and we want to work with them. That's very, 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 very important. Actually, that's the same with the BBC, that we, you know, if you came in and you had this wonderful idea, uh, we could then place you with someone. You could either come in-house at the BBC to do it or, depending on the idea, we could place you with an independent company and uh, many of the independent companies, you know, we're very keen to bring on new talent and actually in music, particularly women directors, because we have very few... Uh, women directors and music uh, coming forward at the moment so we're very keen to hear from women <laughs> so um, I'm afraid it's 11.30 um, so you will have to chat afterwards but I think lots and lots of ideas out there and I look forward to the day where a film about jockey underpants is shown on BBC One prime time <laughs> Bye. thank you very much for listening Yeah, okay.